Hello. Thanks for having me. Um, today I'm going to be chatting about alignment through ownership. So using public markets as a source for indigenous capital. And uh, over the next eight minutes, try and take you on that arc that I guess has been the last year. Um, before I get started, turn on my speaking notes, excuse me. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the, the land that we're on, uh, Blackfoot Confederacy, Métis Three region of Alberta. Um, just like, it's important to acknowledge that we are meeting here today and, and that, uh, yeah, just important to acknowledge that. So maybe just getting into a little bit about myself, maybe before, uh, I know I met some of you, but in a little context for what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, I am a professional engineer by training, currently uh, doing some consulting work on an uh, infrastructure project actually up in Canada's Northwest Territories. So um, that line is to, uh, from Calgary to Tuktoyaktuk, and I'm just working in Inuvik. So Tuktoyaktuk is actually my father's uh, home community, um, and it's yeah, about 2,250 kilometers away from here. So to give you some scale, um, actually got in last night at about one o'clock. So this time yesterday I was in the Inuvik airport uh, waiting to board a flight. And then nine hours later, I arrived here, finished these slides. Um, <laughs> and then maybe that picture is just, you know, that's, that was while well, the sun was up last trip. So that's at the Arctic Ocean. If you get to the end of the Dempster Highway and the uh, Inuvik Tuck Highway, that, that's the sign that greets you. So uh, just a little context. Um, oh, maybe before too. Um, I guess my professional experience is really rooted in major projects and those projects that uh, have uh, significant Indigenous relations issues. So uh, maybe for the first part of my career, um, it was off and on uh, from about 1999 to 2014. So about 15 years of trying to advance the uh, getting hydrocarbons out of the Mackenzie Delta. And that was through a number of uh, uh, different companies, but really all tied to the Mackenzie Gas Project. And in that, there were the communities along that route uh, were looking uh, for equity ownership. And that was through the Aboriginal Pipeline Group. And that's where I first got exposed to this idea, um, trying to advance Indigenous equity for my own community. Um, and much of my work has really been based out of Calgary as I grew up here. Alignment through ownership. So what's the problem? Well, I guess maybe just to start, I think past development just didn't translate into economic benefits for Indigenous communities. Um, there are success cases, but those are uh, uh, the exception and not the norm. And so looking for new ways of doing business to deliver benefits to communities impacted. So increasingly, Indigenous communities through changing regulations and uh, just self-empowerment are looking at equity as a way to deliver those benefits uh, through own source revenue um, to their communities. And they're looking uh, for ownership in those assets and companies that are involved in natural resource and uh, infrastructure. Um, we can get into why that is, those two sectors, or at least those are the two that I think have the most potential uh, for Indigenous equity to really advance at a, a scale maybe not yet seen. But what's preventing that is access to capital. Access to capital is still the ba biggest barrier. Uh, the old saying, it takes money to make money. It couldn't be more true. Um, so there's, uh, Indigenous equity is being acquired, but um, there's you know, usually conditions and it's uh, few and far between, unfortunately, across you know, the entire spectrum of investment in Canada. So maybe why resource and infrastructure? I think it's important just to acknowledge that um, Indigenous rights are rooted, uh, are land-based. Um, you know, we can see this in the Constitution under Section 35 and how that translates into a duty to consult and accommodate when proponents are, are looking to develop uh, uh, natural resources or put infrastructure in uh, that affects Indigenous communities. And more so now, um, the, you know, the changing is, uh, sorry, maybe the goalposts might be changing in terms of what is that threshold for Indigenous um, buy-in to what's happening on their traditional territories. And that's um, the adoption of UNDRIP federal, federally and uh, provincially. Um, and that's really, you know, and where that's going or where I see um, the empowerment of Indigenous communities um, through, for self-government is really that pre and prior informed consent and that threshold being reached before major projects can be undertaken. I don't think, I think it's going to be very difficult to get there, but um, that's certainly the trajectory we're on and we're not there yet, but uh, I think that's where the puck is going, to use a hockey term. <laughs> 
So um, maybe just to get into um, the current landscape, um, you know, I, I had mentioned that, you know, if you read the news, I know you guys are all very interested in uh, energy and certainly in Alberta, you, you'll see great successes um, being reported, you know, from companies like Enbridge and TC and Suncor and Adco and, and any number of Cascade Power. Um, the, these com companies are, are proponents or the companies are leading um, discussions and working with communities to advance Indigenous equity. They see it's in their interest. They think it's, um, well, I don't want to speak for them, but clearly through their actions, they, they're taking steps to align themselves uh, with those communities, and I think that's great. Um, but it is just emerging, um, really. Uh, I said I got into this in 1999. I didn't see anything until 2017 that got me excited, and I'd actually given up in 2016. Still, I was just thought I was on the wrong path. Uh, but then the, the Suncor East Tank Farm deal happened, and it, ironically enough, it happened in the middle of my executive MBA finance class, and somebody shared it, and I, I told the, the person, uh, I, I think I hushed the teacher, and I made the person stand up and read the article, and then I got really excited. So, <laughs> um, And you know, in, since 2017, there's been about 10 large transactions. Um, the pace is certainly increasing. I think there's been maybe four major announcements since... I presented this in March, I think, with the EFL, so just great to see. But, you know, kind of give it a scale. It's about $5 billion worth of Indigenous equity has been created so far. And really, you know, this, I think this, this shift is really being driven by UNDRIP. I mean, it, you know, the why is maybe academic, but, you know, that, that's my sense of it, certainly. And, and just the community is really leaning into that, you know, we have a, we have a right to... Uh, determine what happens on our territory, and we're going to exercise that. And companies are buying into that. And I think there's a number of reasons why they should, and it you know can create. Uh, we talk about future fit hydrocarbons. I think what I'm going to go through next is really future fit companies, right? And so how do you achieve those? But again, just to make it clear, access to capital is the biggest problem for Indigenous communities. Um, not just for me. I think you know a l number of people who study the subject in detail they arrive at that same. Conclusion. Um, I, I, uh, every time I have a chance to talk with somebody in the space, I, I try and you know make sure my assumptions are grounded in reality. And and either what, top number one or two is really access to capital. Um, it's probably worth saying too is that the rate of capital is also important. But that's you know let's just start with <laughs> getting some first, and then of course bringing bring those the the cost uh, of capital for, to indigenous communities down also. And so I think I touched on um, the, uh, the, the types of, of uh, the current landscape and these companies um, taking, the, taking a lead to a proponent model. And then it's really augmented by loan guarantees um, from really government support in, in the form of uh, uh, Crown Corporations. And so here in Alberta, we have the Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, or AIOC. Um, they're doing incredible work. I think they've maybe done three, three transactions so far. Uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank, they also have, excuse me, a pool of money which they're looking to, again, at, uh, advance Indigenous ownership, but more specifically in um, new energies, so things that are aligned with climate commitments. So um, just a, a point to maybe make is that each of these cases, it's a bit reactive, is that the community is approached you know, by a proponent with an opportunity and they, they're reacting to it. And they're also dependent on, uh, they're kind of once removed in terms of really getting the capital. Like, so in the terms of a proponent-led model, community is dealing you know, with uh, a proponent and that proponent really has a fiduciary duty to shareholders. So that community is once removed from asking what I believe is the right uh, people, which is the people with the money. And then in the, the government model, <laughs> uh, the communities you know, looking, you know, are working with government to secure loan guarantees, but that's political. It's slow, and, uh, uh, and I think there's a number of conditions on that. Uh, both both uh, Crown Corporations are really looking for very little risk um, because you know, they have a fiduciary duty to, their, to the people whose money they're managing. And in the case of the government, well, supposedly you know, they're looking out for us as taxpayers. Uh, to uh, not, not invest in bad ideas, and, and rightfully so. But I think there's space for something new uh, in it, and, or that there's a space that Indigenous communities need to start occupying, and those Indigenous businesses. And that's really, 
uh, the use of public markets. And this is where it kind of gets exciting for me is, is just finding new sources of capital. So, you know, where, where, you know, uh, where are we not existing and, and, you know, what steps should we take to get there? Um, again, future fit hydrocarbon uh, companies. And so, you know, providing a made in Canada solution for investors, right? So that's something that is supports indigenous communities and is auditable in the form of a tradable security. I think that has a tremendous uh, potential to help address the access to capital issue. Um, and, you know, just broadly speaking, there's a tremendous opportunity for Canada and for indigenous communities in, you know, what is both the need uh, for new energy and materials to support the energy transition, but also in light of what happened uh, geopolitically in, with Russia and Ukraine, Russia off the table, the, the largest country by landmass, uh, is off the table for investment. Number two is Canada, and if we want to realize that, you know, we have to, I think, work quicker, or else that capital will just go somewhere else um, where they can meet the timelines that, uh, that really us as consumers are demanding, because you know, it, the need gets met. So, <laughs> SPACs, I'm not sure. This is probably the only jargon I hope to use, um, but special purpose acquisition companies. This is, in my journey to try and solve this problem for a project I was trying to advance, uh, personally trying to revitalize. Uh, I knew it could only be revitalized if it had indigenous equity ownership. Uh, indigenous equity participation, excuse me. Um, and in order to do that, I needed a new tool. And so I was just looking, you know, at what was there and just trying to repurpose it. And then came across SPACs and I just couldn't shake the idea for about eight, 10 months of it just knowing that there's potential there. And for those who um, aren't familiar with them, uh, 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 there was a, a mania, I guess you could call it, or a, a SPAC bubble really during COVID. I think something like a little over $200 billion was raised uh, for SPACs um, to go out and do uh, different types of transactions. But what was interesting about it is, you know, kind of the wide variety of, of uh, companies and sectors that SPACs were being created in, and uh, also just the level of capital that was available to them. And so uh, SPAC is a blank shell company, so that if you raise money uh, from investors, it's held in trust so that uh, that money uh, can be later deployed for an, uh, a merger with a private company. And so sponsor just is the person who's looking to do the deal. So the people who have insight into um, where there's potential to invest. And I think specifically, I think indigenous communities can start acting like a sponsor and I'll get into that. And the merger is a backdoor to public markets that really caught my attention because I think that you know, the front door is not open and how do I know that? Because there's no indigenous um, publicly come or no public companies that have large indigenous ownership or even any auditable indigenous ownership. So I like that that you know finding a workaround for what I think is a common problem, and you know a SPAC's typically just one investment. So kind of this this was the the graphic stuck in my head for I don't know so call it two months um, and just. Try and, this is a typical transaction just for, to help lay out the example or help provide some context for the example I'm going to lay out next. Um, SPAC uh, sponsor, this is who would be a group of indigenous, oh, I'll just say, I'll go through the generic first. Excuse me, I'm going to slide ahead of myself. SPAC sponsor creates uh, an IPO where you can buy shares as public investors sold at $10, sold at uh, $10 a share in a typical uh, SPAC. There's 40 million shares, so generates about $400 million, which is held in trust. Um, that SPAC sponsor begins to go look around that landscape for deals and transactions, which you know, meet their, uh, uh, the objectives of, of the company and the investors. So you can get into the example, but they go and source a private company, do that transaction, investment bankers get paid, because investment bankers always get paid. And so what the breakthrough for me was really just realizing you've got to work within what already exists. So uh, changing the economics, no, that's, you know, that's, that's, an ask, that's a bridge too far. But when in the power in realizing is that SPACs, the power of a SPAC is, is if you actually have deal flow and you have opportunities being presented to you. Um, and so when there was a mania, those people actually 
who did SPACs, they didn't have any value, they weren't being able to attract deals, they couldn't do transactions. So, but what I realized is that indigenous communities are being presented with uh, a tremendous number of opportunities, but they're not necessarily being able to realize them. And so just working within what exists is that really just looking at indigenous groups with a co-sponsor, can get into that, but uh, can fit within this structure already. Investment bankers get paid, uh, private companies looking to go public and access uh, new money, you know, continue uh, to go through the same avenues that have worked previously. And, and more importantly, I think it gives public and ESG investors a made in Canada solution where there's real value being delivered from the sponsor. So here's um, a real example that I actually tried to pursue. So once I kind of got to the point where I realized that uh, the strategy would work, I needed to begin to go and you know, make it specific. And so just starting, you know, try and make it into a card, make it ex easily explainable when you're dealing with finance and indigenous communities, you wanna just keep it simple, stupid. So you know, what is the SPAC? So it's, we're looking at ESG, wind and solar. That's the sector and that's as specific as you need to be. Who is the syndicate of indigenous economic development corps with a co-sponsor. That co-sponsor could be somebody like a Brookfield, a KKR, Black, BlackRock, like these types of mega funds who would see value and competitive advantage in terms of who they're competing against by aligning with indigenous communities where those deals you know, aren't being presented to private equity. And then you know, how, are you, how do you do it? Well, you raise, you, know, you sell 40 million shares at $10 a share, and this is how you, ha you have the capital in hand. Um, and then just, because of the power of debt, you know, $400 million raised, you could probably look at a transaction between 800 to you know, $1 billion. So here is kind of the real world example that I spent hundreds of hours on that was all for nothing. Um, kind of, so keeping with this, you know, same slide, that, you know, looking at ESG, wind and solar, a syndicate of indigenous economic development corporations partnered with a mega fund, has this in hand, and then you just begin to go, you know, insert deal here, you gotta go look what's for sale, what can you buy, what makes sense, maybe start, you know, three, two, one. Uh, taking a good uh, private company public, you know, that's kind of what SPACs were made for, or IPOs, um, there's the opportunity to look at those. This is just a generic example. Number two would be like, okay, it's a, a distressed sale of a company that was mismanaged, where there's an opportunity to buy it, um, uh, improve the operations, make it profitable. Um, and then number three was, okay, a divestment of assets from an existing company. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I, I certainly know there's uh, a demand for wind and solar and that there's funds being, look, uh, funds are looking to deploy in this area, like stating the obvious here, um, but that it, it was you know, for sale in my region where I, I had a network. And so I just zeroed in on this one and it was, Incredibly exciting, I guess, to go through the process of figuring out if you could actually raise that amount of money or if even, even if you needed to because there's an opportunity to maybe just take, uh, take deals to SPACs that aren't able to find a qualifying transaction. That was another breakthrough. Um, but that there was, I, th I felt confident after going through this exercise, even though it wasn't successful, that I was able to um, identify indigenous communities that were interested in, in, in actually purchasing those assets. They were actively looking at it themselves, but didn't have the scale needed to actually get, um, uh, to, to, be, to be successful in the bidding process. I felt like I was succe uh, successful in really realizing that there's a number of ways to go about accessing this level of money. And, uh, and then, you know, the other learning, which was the hard one, which is you gotta work quicker. Um, in both maybe my learning curve, well, it shortened up, but more importantly, I think indigenous communities, if you want to uh, uh, work, work like this, you need to work at this speed and kind of get into that in a second. But, and this kind of brings it to the end of the discussion is really what is the next step? So, you know, the EFL offered me the opportunity to um, uh, share the idea, really work on the communication of the idea, you know, take, expand my network in terms of, you know, bouncing ideas off of people. And I think, and then I kind of went away and did a bunch of work and kind of 
happy to come back and report. I think you know, there's a couple of different areas that the EFL could contribute, and it's really looking at um, uh, standardization and, and improving, just you know, shortening up those time windows. And so you're just having um, you have uh, companies that work here who would be interested in you know equity participation of indigenous communities, but understanding what their parameters are, understanding. Um, from a community perspective, understanding you know, what their priorities and parameters are if they were looking to do a transaction like this. So trying to ultimately get to, I think, a more standardized contract for that equity participation so that it could be shopped around. And, and you know, certain uh, scenarios you know, require different types of structures, but the one I laid out you know, that on that existing asset that's just being sold that isn't tied to development, Right? It's an existing asset. It's not tied to uh, uh, excuse me, a project agreement with an indigenous community that indigenous communities could just go out and begin to acquire assets in the Canadian economy. And that was exciting. So, but you know, shortening up that timeline. If you want to uh, work in public markets, you have to work at the speed of public markets. And then, thank you. And this is just a picture actually of uh, me um, right outside of Taktiaktak. Um, they're looking at an energy security project. Energy poverty is a, a very big thing up in the Arctic, uh, very expensive. So the project looks to take an existing natural gas well, turn it into LNG, and then you know, ship it around to the local communities to help reduce the cost. So there's some challenges with that and learnings. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. It's just a side slide. But thank you, and happy to have any discussions later.